that they represent. A copy or the things that are real. They're two different things. So many people in life get caught up with the copy. Much of our lives are caught up, if you will, with the copies. Our material lives that we live, the Bible says, is very important. God knows that we need food on the table. We need to pay all of our bills. And every one of us is dependent uh, uh, upon something, either God or something, to provide monetarily. But the money things and the material things of life, according to Scripture, they're really uh, only pictures, like a picture of my daughter, and they're not the realities of true riches. Today, we want to look at this concept of true riches, what it means to be truly rich. If you have your bulletin, you'll see that we have a a passage of Scripture here in Luke. And I'd ask you to turn in your Bibles or just take a look at that. Luke 16, verses 10 through 12. I'll read the word of the Lord. Luke 16, verses 10 through 12. Here's what Jesus would say. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? And this little pointed word from Jesus, it follows up a story that we looked at last week. And so if you're here and this is your first time here, last week we looked at a story of an unwise manager who really was misusing a rich man's money. He was given the responsibility for all this money like a trustee in an estate, but he misused it. He just kind of spent it haphazardly. The word even says that he kind of scattered it all about. And the boss man came around and he said, you know what, I don't like the job you're doing, so I'm going to fire you. And that particular man said, well, I don't know what's going to happen when he fires me. I can't dig a ditch because I'm not strong enough and I'm too proud to beg. And so he went in with the uh, kind of a, a, a conspiracy with this guy's debtors. And he said, let me reduce your debt so that when I later lose my job, then he would know people would take care of him. Jesus told that story not to tell us business practices, but to tell us he wants us to be shrewd. Shrewd means acting today because of what's going to happen tomorrow. Shrewd means putting some plan into action in the present because of what's going to happen in the future. That's what it means to be shrewd. And Jesus used a a very negative example in Luke 16 to try to teach us shrewdness. Now, some people are shrewd in business, and when they are, they cheat other people, they live for themselves. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying that we should have eternity in our perspective as we live life. In other words, we should be thinking about eternity, even after we die, and, and, and long after we're gone. Keep that in mind in the way you spend money. Now, if you're visiting with us, I uh, always feel uncomfortable speaking about money because the idea in many people have a bad church is they want to get your fanny in the seat so they can get their hand on your wallet. I've heard that over and over, even from people who are very dear to me, not in my own immediate family, but some other people uh, that are, yeah, I better may I clarify this. You go up to my kids, why do you think that? No, I, uh, it's not my kids, not my wife, but some other people are very dear to me that church is all about money. And I want to tell you, it's not all about money. But we look at money through Jesus' eyes. And what he trying, he's trying to tell us is that the way you handle money, the types of priorities you give, and the types of things that you give to, will affect life after you're gone, after you're dead. Now in this passage, in Luke 16, verses 10 through 12, the key word is true riches. 
He's wanting us to understand a deeper value about money. He wants us to understand something that is the reality, and money itself is only a picture. It really is not the reality itself. So what would Jesus be talking about in this kingdom principle about something being true, reality? In John 1.17 John writes, for the law was given through Moses and grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now I want you to understand what he's getting at. The law was given through Moses. We all understand that in the Old Testament. But grace and truth, that's the word for true, came through Jesus Christ. Now I want you to please understand what he's not saying. He's not saying everything in the Old Testament is false and Jesus showed the truth. That's not what he's saying. The Old Testament is true. The word aletheia is not used of true versus false. It's more used of things that are the pictures and the things that are the realities themselves. So what it's saying is this. The law came through Moses and all of this Old Testament tabernacle and sacrificial system and all of that. All of that was a symbol. All of it was a picture. All of it was pointing to something that would become true in Jesus Christ. Now with that in mind, it's the same word that he uses in verse 11. That if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? In other words, by the way that we use money, the way that we use our, our, our very substance that God has given us will be the degree that we understand deeper truth. I didn't know that kingdom principle when I first started out in my journey with Jesus. That sometimes... God can't trust greater truth, the deeper realities, to someone who doesn't handle the symbols well. Let me tell you how important this is. You know, our elders serve well. They serve and they give of themselves. But if they don't give to the church, they can't lead you. Why? Because the way they handle money will be the issue about the way they're given deeper truths in God's word. The true riches God wants to deposit in every one of us. But it is tied, very interestingly, to money. Now let me share with you a kingdom principle that is true and it's deeper than just dollars and cents. You ready? It's found in Philippians 4. I've included the passage in your bulletin so you can look at it. I want us to look at a deeper sense or a true reality of the riches of God and the riches that money is only a picture. Ready? I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed my, your concern for me. This is Paul writing to the church in Philippi. In other words, there had been a long period of time, 10 years, since their church had been established. But he says, now you've restored and renewed some kind of concern for me. Let's keep reading. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I'm in need. For I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. You know, one of the things that we're finding in this passage is the kingdom principle of receiving and giving. When it comes to receiving money, God is calling us to contentment. Be content. I love that word content because it is a, a very rich picture uh, in, in the old, or excuse me, New Testament language. It means to be self-sufficient or independent because you have everything you need within. In other words, there's not one thing on the outside that you need to complete who you are. 
fascinating that contentment is very closely tied to who we think we are in Christ. It isn't tied to our bank account or how secure we feel because we've got enough saved up. It isn't about the situations and the circumstances we face. Guess what it's about? It's being secure 